The Notre Dame fans are still milling around here at the Cotton Bowl, savoring the upset victory of Notre Dame over Texas by a score of 38 to 10. They came down, of course, to watch Notre Dame attempt to knock off the nation's number one ranked team because the Texas Longhorns on successive weekends knocked off Oklahoma right here at uh, this stadium and the following week they knocked off Arkansas two teams that were to lose only one game each themselves and uh, of course to lay claim to a high ranking and so Notre Dame came into play the team that had of all the major teams in the country gone undefeated untied until this afternoon Notre Dame has now defeated Texas by a score of 38 to 10 and as we have said so very often as you heard coach Dan Devine say they properly lay claim themselves to the national championship that will be decided by your favorite poll or you can make your own selection because there is no official national championship. Paul Horning? Well, it's just a great day for the Irish, no question about that, and I hope we can get into the locker room and talk to some of those kids because I was with them all week long, Lindsay. I watched them work out four days, and when it was supposed to be dummy scrimmage and half speed, the linebackers were popping the receivers, the guards were popping the defensive linemen, and Dan Devine had a hard time not keeping them uh, from really injuring each other. They wanted to hit each other. They were uh, ready to play this football game, and they really felt after looking at the films that maybe uh, they were Texas defense especially. I think the offensive linemen felt that they could move Texas's defense out of there and give the running backs a little running room. And well, Heavens got uh, 101 yards on 22 carries. Ferguson got 100 yards even on 22 carries. Montana threw, threw the ball 25 times. He completed 10 for 107 yards, no interceptions, and one, one touchdown. And Paula, well, I asked you, I don't think you... Uh, I looked at a lot of game film of Texas, and I never saw Texas turn the ball over so much. It's official now. They had six turnovers. Notre Dame got the ball on all six occasions inside the 35-yard line and turned them into scores. Yeah, a lot of Texas' success up to this point this year had, had uh, been traceable to the fact that, in large part, they had been able to avoid the turnover. And uh, you know, as you said, they turned it over six times today, and Notre Dame cashes in six times. It's got to make a difference. Need to say this though, Texas was 5-5-1 five, five, and one a year ago. Most, most people thought they'd finish fourth or lower in the Southwest Conference, not the nation. Great so turnaround. It's, it's kind of a kick for them to be here. And hey, Freddie Akers, Lin, uh, Lindsay and I were out uh, for the Fiesta Bowl last year for CBS. We watched uh, his Wyoming team just just get uh, just killed by Oklahoma. And I'm sure on two consecutive years that uh, Freddie Akers is not feeling too good again this New Year's. All right, let's go down to the field now to Jack Whitaker. Well, thank you, Lindsay. Two words jump to mind, jubilation. I haven't seen such jubilation as this since VE Day in Paris. And the second thing is continuity. I think for over a half a century, more decades than I've been alive, that whenever a Notre Dame team has come into a big game as an underdog, they manage to win it somehow. This has gone through Newt Rockney, Leahy, Elmer Layden. It doesn't matter who the coach is. It doesn't seem to matter who the players are. It's the great tradition of Notre Dame, and today we saw it again. Uh, as you've been hearing all afternoon, the national championship now will probably be decided by ballot. And one is, uh, <laughs> boggles the mind to think how many points Oklahoma is going to try put on the board tonight against Arkansas. It's uh, a little unfortunate that it has to be done by ballot, but certainly Penn State and Oklahoma and those other teams have a claim to it. But one thing Notre Dame can take back to South Bend even if it's not number one, is the fact that they carry through that great tradition of their school in a very historic manner. And as Paul Horning knows so well, to a Notre Dame man, that sometimes is more important than being number one. All right, Jack Whitaker, and here at the Cotton Bowl, the Texas band is marching at the far end. The fans are still milling around. The Notre Dame fans don't want to leave. When you're in trouble, it's good to know you can call someone who will bring help fast. An independent insurance agent who represents the cavalry. The Kemper Insurance Company and other fine companies. In a world of red tape, here's a maverick who's tough, fast, and fair. So when you're in trouble, your independent agent will be there. Where do you find help like this? In the yellow pages under Kemper.
I dare you to knock this off. I dare you to compare anybody's batteries, anybody's, with alkaline power cells and try to beat them for long life. You know what? You can't. When you want long-lasting energy, you can't buy a longer-lasting all-purpose power system than gold, red, and black alkaline power cells from EverReady. The power cell that dares to compare. Come on, I dare you. Final score, Notre Dame 38 and Texas 10. The shadows have lengthened across this Cotton Bowl stadium. It has seen so many historic football games. It seems saw two previous football games between these same two teams. As a matter of fact, if you talk to people like Wilbur Evans, the executive vice president and general manager of the Cotton Bowl game, he will tell you that the Cotton Bowl gained its present stature in 1970. When Notre Dame came to Dallas to play the Texas Longhorns, who had gone undefeated and who were to win the national championship, Notre Dame for 45 years had not been to a bowl game. They had been to the 1925 bowl game when the Four Horsemen had defeated Ernie Nevers and Stanford, and then Notre Dame had declined myriad requests to appear in postseason games, but then accepted the bid of the Cotton Bowl to come here and play Texas in 1970. And from that moment on, the Cotton Bowl gained a new stature. It also uh, gained new attention. It gained higher ratings, more money. Each of these schools will take home approximately $1 million each by having appeared in the Cotton Bowl here this afternoon. And uh, the next year, it was the same matchup, the same two teams. And that year, Notre Dame won. Notre Dame with an upset victory over Texas. It snapped the Texas winning streak at 30 straight games. So they were one and one. And this was the rubber game here this afternoon as Notre Dame won it by a score of 38 to 10. Any more comments, Paul Horning? Well, I tell you, you know, I had the opportunity to, at a very young age to come down to Dallas as a member of the Notre Dame football team and play right here in this Cotton Bowl to a sellout crowd. And it's always a great uh, thrill for any Notre Dame football player when you go on the road because you receive such great backing from their fans. And today, uh, even though this was the host team and Texas, of course, representing the Southwest Conference, they had uh, probably three to one more fans here in the Cotton Bowl. Notre Dame could hear their fans backing. They had about 20 or 30,000 people here. Well, they could. Now let's go down to the down to the locker room, rather, to uh, Don Cricky, who has Joe Montana. We do indeed. Joe Montana was the guy who started the season as the number three quarterback at Notre Dame. And, and then in that Mississippi game, when they lost, he was on the bench. And the next week, if the Notre Dame ship wasn't sinking, he was indeed in flames when Joe Montana came in and rallied Notre Dame to victory against Purdue. And he's been on top ever since. And you had a great game today, Joe. Well, thank you very much. I think I owe a lot of success to the offensive line. They did a great job. Took the ball right up the middle to, to their defense. And they opened up the holes, and the backs ran super. You know, coming into the game, your coaches said they had never seen Notre Dame teams so keen in practice. Uh, some of the coaches, like Joe Yato, heads up the defense. In all the years he's been at Notre Dame, had never seen practices as sharp as you had this week. You guys are really ready. Yeah, I think, you know, coming down here, playing the number one team, and possibly for the national championship, had a lot to do with that. We had a lot of, you know, spirited workouts this week. We had one day we were down, but the next day we made up for it. We were twice as high as before, and just had a great week of practice. Now, Joe, you're a junior. You'll be back next year with uh, most of your offensive backfield, all of it, I guess. Huh? Yes, I will. I'm looking forward to that, and starting probably in February sometime. I guess it was kind of difficult coming away. You're away for Christmas. You came down here on uh, December 23rd. You worked in the Cotton Bowl. In a sense, it was a home game for Texas. They played two regular season games here, but you fellas seem to take to that field. Yeah, you know, the turf was a little rough on our legs when we first came down, and like you said, it was almost a home game for Texas. I think 90, well, 75% of the the fans were for Texas, but all the work coming down before Christmas and spending it here where I think paid off. Joe, again, congratulations. Thank you very much. Joe Montana, the quarterback for Notre Dame. Here is Terry Urich, a little fullback who is one of the Notre Dame offensive co-captains who I guess scored the first two touchdowns and took a couple reps in the head, but you're all right. Oh, yeah. I, uh, the only injuries I really had, I guess, I broke my helmet and got a few stitches here, and then uh, towards the end of the game, well, I guess the second half, I made a pass reception, and uh, I landed on top of the ball and knocked the wind out of me. That, hey, it's great great to be on top right now, you know, and I hope that uh, sports writers all over the country, you know, look at our victory and uh, realize that we are number one. And I hope so. We right. certainly have a legitimate claim to it. Uh, Alabama, I understand, won big today also, but Alabama was, I guess, a one-point victory over USC, and you guys blew them out. I guess this was a bigger game, though, wasn't it, for than USC? Oh, yeah. 
Yeah, it's great to beat USC because we haven't beaten them in our careers, and uh, that started it off. And then to come down here and play Texas, who was rated number one deservingly, but uh, we came in and beat them today convincingly and showed people that we are number one. And I, I truly believe that. There's no doubt in my mind. Mississippi game's behind us, and we just took it to them. We're ready. Terry Urich is one of the co-captains. Uh, you've experienced the uh, the downs and then I should say the ups of this ball club after the Mississippi game. Uh, it was a team that was picked in the preseason bowls to be the national champions. And then you lost that game. You're losing the next week against Purdue. What turned this team around all of a sudden? Well, I'd say that, you know, we came out and uh, I don't think we as players really realized our potential until the second half of that Purdue game when we put it back together. We all drew close and uh, went deep down inside ourselves and uh, came out with a victory. We had to come from behind to beat him. And then the next week uh, went on to play somebody else and then we played USC. And uh, I think that was a big turning point in our season. So we've, we've climbed since then and uh, I think we've got it. I hope so. I think, I think you'll be handing out a few game balls, won't you? I know you'll take one back to South Bend. I just want a national championship ring. That's what I've come to Notre Dame for when I played football. And uh, I want a diamond ring when I get out of here. All right, Terry, congratulations Thank again. Thank you very much. Terry Urich, this is uh, Big Ross Browner, one of the defensive co-captains, the man who won the Outland Award last year as the best defensive lineman in the country, who's made every All-American team. And they were yelling at the end there, Ross's boss, the whole defense was. Well, you know, I thought we just played a great, tremendous uh, defensive game. And, you know, we just went and followed our whole game plan. Everybody just went out and executed just beautiful. And, uh, you know, when you had total team... You know, just concentration, effort, and everything. You know, everything was just great. And uh, that's the reason why we won this game. You know, we beat a good team, you know, uh, Texas, you know. And uh, I really think that we were the last ones that had the chance. So, really, you know, we should be number one and everything like that. And, you know, I just want to say hello to my mother and all my family out there. And I would say number one, Notre uh, Dame. Ross, did you ever have any uh, a dream that you'd blow this club out? Well, we knew that, uh, you know, everybody can be beat. You know, if the only thing you had to do is go out and execute. And we knew that. You know, if we went out and just followed through our assignment, followed our job, and just executed just perfectly, then, you know, there's nothing they can do. And I'm, I'm pretty sure that we showed that today. I thought we had another quarter to go, so I, you know, I still had that, you know, intensity in me. So really, you know, it was just a beautiful game, and I'm very happy that, you know, we beat the University of uh, Texas. But uh, don't take anything away from them, and, you know, we just really did a great job out there. No question, you guys are ready to play football. We'll meet Ken McAfee, the All-American tight end. But first, let's go back to Lindsey Nelson. All right, a crowd of over 72,000 was on hand. This stadium had been sold out for a couple of months, and now only the straggling few are left, having seen it go Notre Dame 38, Texas 10. Here comes the king. Here comes the king. Here comes the big number one. Here comes the king. But why the fear the king is second to none? When you say fun, one taste will tell you. So loud and clear. It's a snow tire in the winter, it's a rain tire in the fall, it's a sun tire in the summer, it's the one that does it all. Good years new tempo for all seasons, for all year, it moves through snow and ice, yet runs quiet in the clear. Tiempo is a tough double steel belted radio with a special tread design for all kinds of weather. Snow tire, rain tire, sun tire, one tire Tiempo does it all. Next Saturday and Sunday from New York, CBS Sports will present the final rounds of the Grand Prix Masters with Guillermo Vilas, Jimmy Connors, and Bjorn Borg heading a field of eight of the world's leading players competing for the prestigious Grand Prix Masters title. The field of eight was chosen based on one of the most grueling and demanding year-long point system circuits that included 76 major tournaments throughout the world, including Wimbledon and the U.S. Open. The total prize money for the Grand Prix circuit is the largest in the game. The top eight-point finishers earn the right to compete in the Masters for the $100,000 first prize. Leading the field is Guillermo Vilas, the Grand Prix point leader who will attempt to solidify his claim as the number one player in the world. He'll be challenged by the reigning Wimbledon champion, Bjorn Borg. Jimmy Connors will be seeking revenge against Vilas and Borg for losses to them in the finals of Wimbledon and the U.S. Open. 
With two wins over Vilas, Brian Gottfried, who finished second in the total Grand Prix points, is a player to be reckoned with. Manuel Aratis, the defending Masters champion, has come on strong to finish fourth in the points innings and is a threat to go all the way. Rounding out the field will be Mexican sensation Raul Ramirez, hard-serving Roscoe Tanner, and Eddie Dibbs. Be sure and be with us for what promises to be a shootout of the superstars, the Grand Prix Masters, next Saturday at 3 and live coverage of the final Sunday at 4 p.m. Eastern. You betcha. Okay. If Earl Campbell, the great Texas fullback, isn't the number one player drafted by the NFL next May, the first player selected, this guy probably will be. It's Ken McAfee, number 81, the big tight end. Ken, there was a lot of optimism on your team coming down here. I don't think anybody was more outwardly optimistic that you'd beat Texas than yourself. Well, of course, you know, I made some controversial uh, statements at the Heisman. I think a lot of the Texas players got upset about, but uh, I simply expressed a desire to win the national championship, and I think we certainly proved that today by beating them by such a score. Uh, we certainly had no indication that it would be this, uh, this lopsided, but, uh, you know, we knew we had to beat them. They were the team to beat, and we are very fortunate that we had a chance to play uh, Texas, and... Uh, play the number one team and we just went out and showed them who was number one. I guess you caught four balls today but the real turning point in the game the deciding factor was uh, at the line of scrimmage you won both ways offense and defense. Oh it certainly was a defense just had an incredible game gave us field position all day long and I think uh, they talked about Texas team speed on defense and they were very quick but I think our offensive line showed them that uh, we were also as quick as they were if not quicker we just beat them to the ball and uh, things just went our way. We talked to Terry Urich about the transition in this team, Ken, after you'd lost the Mississippi game, and uh, really your dream of a national championship appeared at that time to be gone. All of a sudden, the turnabout came. Uh, what would you attribute it to? Well, of course, it was a great deal of frustration after our Pittsburgh uh, victory. We didn't play well, and of course, the Mississippi loss. Uh, I think the great turning point was when Joe Montana came in and, of course, took over the quarterback position. The Purdue game, we were 14 points behind, and we had to come back and win, and of course, we played our Southern Cal game. Uh, they were, that was a great turning point for us also. But I think uh, the team rallied after a loss to Mississippi. We knew every game was a must game if we uh, wanted to win the national championship, if it became a reality for us. And uh, we knew we had to win nine games and beat Texas today. And I think it was just a motivating factor to the team, uh, just being come unified with each other, I think. Ken, congratulations. All the best in the NFL. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Ken McAfee. And this is Willie Fry, number 94, one of Notre Dame's defensive co-captains. Well, you must be a happy guy right now. You don't look too happy. Hey, I'm really happy, believe me. <laughs> With a win over Texas like this, uh, you know, who couldn't be happy? Uh, was it a surprising uh, a game to you, Willie, in that uh, the score was so lopsided and the final numbers came in? Well, it was surprising that the score was as lopsided as it was, but we knew all along that we were going to go out and, and really put it to them defensively. Uh, we didn't feel that, you know, Texas had been hit uh, as hard as our defense was capable of hitting them, and, you know, with all the talk and the things about Texas down here, that was a tremendous shot to our pride. And we just set out to hit them that, you know, show them that, you know, we can play good, hard-nosed football. They turned the ball over seven times. You were stripping the ball uh, from McEachin in the first half and the running backs. What were you doing, just uh, hit, putting your helmet on the football? That's it, just, you know, finding that football and really sticking it to them. And, you know, when you play good, hard-nosed defense like that, you know, turnovers are bound to ensue. And we just tried to capitalize on it. I think all along we've been, you know, sort of an opportunist defense and uh, it showed out in the field today okay well I think it's time for a party yeah that's right hello folks back in Memphis Tennessee and my mom all right <laughs> and here is Luther Bradley who a lot of pro scouts think is the prototype of an NFL cornerback 6'3 205 pounds with 435 speed and you had a lot of speed to cover today didn't you Luther well you know I was going to get some Olympic sprinters and um, they were very fast um, but we played a lot of zone defense, and I think we played them well, and they, we covered them excellent. How about the, the weather factor now? You kind of like it cold, I know, having trained up in South Bend. You came down here. It was pretty nice all week, and then it got a little mean down here. Well, it got cold, but we're, you know, we're used to that, and I'm sure it's about you know, 15, maybe 16 inches of snow back in South Bend waiting on us when we get back. But we enjoyed it down here, and I'm glad we came off with the win. It really is remarkable the way this team pulled together. And around Coach Devine from great pressure, now he's become uh, one of the Notre Dame celebrated coaches. Well, I'm proud for him, and as I think the whole team is, and I'm sure he's looking forward to next year having another fine season. All right, Luther, we thank you so very much and uh, congratulate you on your victory. You, of course, will be going into professional football next year, and you're looking forward to that. I'm, I'm definitely looking forward to that, but I'm also looking, at, looking forward to a career in business. Okay. Luther, all the best. Thank you.
Luther Bradley, cornerback for the University of Notre Dame. put this game on. Our thanks to Stark Taylor Jr. and Buddy Dyke of the Cotton Bowl. We salute Wilbur Evans who is retiring. Our thanks to Jones Ramsey and Roger Valdesuri, to our spotter Steve Collier and Rick Valdesuri, and to our statistician Tom Williams. Lindsay Nelson for Paul Horning and Paul Alexander, Don Cricky and Jack Whitaker, saying goodbye and Happy New Year from the Cotton Bowl, where the final score was Notre Dame 38, Texas 10. A reminder that next Saturday, you'll see the Grand Prix Masters Tennis Championship at 3 p.m. Eastern Time on CBS. The 1978 Cotton Bowl has been sponsored by Buick and its dealers who invite you to see the new Buicks during their holiday get-together. The people in your town who bottle Coca-Cola, Coke adds life to just about everything you do. The General Motors Parts Division. And by Goodyear, developers of such tire innovations as the new all-season Tiempo Radio. The 1978 Cotton Bowl has been a presentation of CBS Sports. An incoming airliner with faulty landing gear sends Tribune staffers to the airport where the tension mounts to even greater heights when it's learned that Hume's daughter is on board. Watch Lou Grant tomorrow on CBS. It started as a gleam in the designer's eye. The super sporty Datsun 200 SX. SX appeal at a Datsun price. It's Datsun driven to the unexpected. I like your style, Dotson. Announcing a unique new motor oil from Exxon Research that can actually save money. New Golden Natural Uniflow. Uniflow was tested in cars like yours. After break-in, it delivered an overall average of 16 extra miles per tank full. Savings like that could cut your gasoline bill the equivalent of about three cents a gallon. New Uniflow motor oil is Exxon's best engine protection ever. It conserves gasoline, saves money. Here's to good friends. Tonight is well, kind of special. Tomorrow we go back to civilization. And let's have a last night in the wilderness party. Yeah, good idea. I've got just what we need. So tonight. Hey. Rob, you've been hiding that all week. I was waiting for the right moment. When you want the taste of a truly great beer, tonight, let it be low and brow. Well, like the song says, here's to good friends. Uh,